In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was full of awe. Boundless creativity bursts forth from our Creator, giving life to a cosmic canvas. His presence filling space and time with wonder and beauty. But the darkness begins to hide this presence, clouding our vision. This overwhelming presence is made small. The holy fear of the Lord, replaced by an unholy fear of man. How long will we stay in this darkness? It's time to return to reverence. To the name above every other name. To the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's time to return to the awe of God.
Heavenly Father, you are the God whose faithfulness never fails. You promised us when two or three gathered in your name, you would be in our midst. And you're faithful to keep that promise. You're here in this room right now. The presence of the one who created the heavens and the earth. The one who sent his son to save and to redeem. The one who has promised his Holy Spirit who would give us power. And that that power would overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil, and every principality. That God is in this room. So every need can be met. Every mountain can be moved. Every life can be changed. And that's what we're here for. So Lord, have your way. Use this holy moment. And let us see your power and your might. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you give the Lord a hand clap and a shout in this house tonight? Come on, Cornerstone, you can do better than that. I said, give an awesome God an awesome shout of praise. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Welcome to Cornerstone Church this marvelous Sunday evening. Tonight, I don't want to waste any time getting to our guest because I know he has a lot to share and to impart, but it is such an honor uh, for me to be able to share life and to partner in ministry with individuals like John and Lisa Bevere. I remember the first time that I had the opportunity to become familiar with John and his work. I was a young pastor. I knew that the Lord had called me to ministry and, and books like Undercover and Bait of Satan were resources that were being provided to the body of Christ and, and there was this name that was new. This young guy, Bevere. And when I knew John was somebody that was worth reading, I found the same book that was on my desk in dad's library. Now, let me tell you something. When John Hagee is reading your book, you've written a book. The thing that has made it such a joy is that decades later, still faithful, still productive, still passionate about seeing the body of Christ know more about who Jesus is and what it means to serve him, having served not only faithfully in the United States but the nations of the world, he and his wife Lisa with Messenger International have resourced and provided resources to local churches all over the nations. It's a wonderful ministry and a tremendous work. His sons are faithfully serving alongside him in ministry. His grandchildren are now growing up in ministry. It's a wonderful thing whenever you as an individual can find people that you can strategically connect your life to and you have a kindred spirit. So tonight we're not having a guest. Tonight we're having a family reunion and our family member who's coming to join us is John Bevere. Would you put your hands together, Cornerstone? and make him welcome here in the house of the Lord tonight. Come on and give honor where honor is due. Hey brother, it's such a long walk up there. I love you, thank you sir. Good evening everybody, everybody stay standing. I wanna pray before bringing the word of God tonight. Can I say, I'm so delighted and honored both to be here. I love this house and I think Pastor Matt was making very light of the partnership. You guys are a massive partner with us in what we are all doing together. Um, what we've been able to accomplish in the last 14 years has blown me away, I still can't even fathom what's happened, but we just last month passed 64 million resources that we've given to pastors and leaders and believers all over the world. And Cornerstone has been a massive partner in this endeavor. And I know there's going to be people coming up to you in heaven the next millions and trillions of years saying, thank you so much for discipling me. I mean, uh, we, we, I think we're short of 14 countries of reaching the entire globe. Let me just tell you a story that happened just a couple weeks ago. And that is our international director, Rob, said, man, I just felt to go to East Timor. We had not given anything to East Timor. He goes there. There's no cell service. 
There is absolutely no, I mean, no GPS. He has no idea where anybody is, any church building. He doesn't have one contact. It just one of our partners said, we want you to go to East Timor. And so he's walking down the road and a guy's closing a gate on the only church that he had seen. He rushed over, he said, are you the pastor? And he goes, no, I'm, he just so happened he was the wealthiest businessman and one of the wealthiest businessmen in the country. He said, this is my home church and I'm just closing the gate today. And he said, well, I'm here because we wanna help pastors and give them resources. The businessman began to weep and weep and he said we have been praying for discipleship resources for this nation and so now it's opened up we're going to be sending thousands of discipleship resources to church leaders in East Timor we also heard just this past week that the Chinese government has now wanting to print the bait of Satan for the three self church and we're just like Lord only you can do something like this so pa pastor Peggy's, both of you, Diane, Pastor Diane, thank you so much because you have been, I don't even know if you know how much you've been involved. You've been involved in a huge way thanks to the friendship of Pastor Matt. And Matt, I didn't know 20 years ago that we'd become such good friends, but my family adores this family. I always say they're one of our favorite ministry families in the United States. I don't think I have to remind you how blessed you are to be under the leadership of the Hagee family. Can you say amen to that? All right, for those of you that don't know me, the best way I can sh introduce myself is show you the most recent picture of my family. Here they are. We just got our fourth son married last year, and he married a beautiful Australian girl, but that's my very best friend of 42 years of marriage, Lisa. I told her just last week, I said, baby, I would marry you tomorrow in a heartbeat if I could. And she said, no, I'm already married. And that's just her personality. And so uh, these are our four sons. They're four beautiful wives and our G-baby. You say, what in the world is a G baby? I am way too young to be grandpa, so it's G daddy and G for short. But you can see Christian is pregnant there, and we had little Azzy come. Azzy is my first Italian looking grandson. I am so glad. And uh, I told Lisa she got too much British into the family. A lot of our other grandchildren look a little British, but that's good too because they're all beautiful and handsome. And, but anyway, Azzy was conceived in Italy, by the way, so he really looks Italian and he completely has me wrapped around his little finger. But that's my family, and the more I love them, the more I realize how much God loves us because we're his big family. Can you say amen to that? Amen. amen. Well, tonight I want to share with you, it's a lot more than a message, it's a burden. And uh, two years ago, God spoke so clearly to my heart, and this is something that I have been praying and seeking God on for 30 years, and I felt like the Lord said, I want this message released into this nation. And so the book came out a year ago. It actually has been a bestseller for the entire year, and it's showing me that it's a message that's resonating with people's hearts. But I believe in order for the nation, the, the, the church of Jesus Christ in our nation, to really return back to where we're called to be, we have got to get the holy, healthy fear of God back into our, into our lives. Amen? And so I don't want you to just get a message tonight. I really want your life to be transformed. How many of you believe God can change your life in one service? Come on. Well, then put up the other hand. Because we don't have, because we don't ask. So we're going to ask him tonight. Amen? So Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight as a people and we're so grateful that you chose us. We didn't choose you first, you chose us and you called us to be your sons and daughters. So I'm asking tonight, Holy Spirit of God, that you would literally invade this sanctuary, that you would manifest the presence of Jesus in this place tonight like we have never experienced before. And I'm asking that as you do this, that we would go from faith to faith, from glory to glory. For I decree that your kingdom has come, your will shall be done in this place on earth as it is in heaven. And for this, we give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise, and the thanksgiving. And it's in Jesus' mighty, wonderful, majestic, awesome, holy, magnificent name we pray. And everybody that agrees shouts. Come on, give him praise for what he's... Amen and amen. You can be seated. All right, so tonight I'm going to open up with just three verses of Scripture. And I want to begin in Isaiah 33, and that is, I got to get it here first, Isaiah 33, verse 6. And I want you to look at these words carefully. It says, the fear of the Lord is God's treasure. 
Would you stop and think about what we just read? Do you have treasures? What do you do with them? How do you handle them? Do you throw them in your junk drawer, put them in your front yard? No, you handle them carefully because they're very, very valuable. The fear of the Lord is God's treasure. If you look at Isaiah 11, verse 3, it says, The fear of the Lord is Jesus' delight. And then if we go into the New Testament, we read the Apostle Paul's words, who wrote, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, not with love and kindness. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So let's just take a step back here for a second and think about this. We're talking about God's treasure, Jesus' delight, and what matures our salvation. Why aren't we talking a whole lot more about this in the Western church? First of all, what is the fear of the Lord? Let me say this, it is not to be scared of God. How can you have a relationship of intimacy with somebody you're afraid of? And yet this is God's absolute passion for you and I. His greatest desire is to be intimate with us. When Moses delivers Israel out of Egypt, if you will look at this, he comes to the foot of the Mount Sinai, the place that he met God in the burning bush. He has a meeting with God, a private meeting, and God says, tell all three million of the Jewish people, the whole reason I delivered you out of Egypt was to bring you to me. He said, Moses, I'm so excited to meet these kids. And he said, you tell them I'm coming down on the beginning of the third day and to get ready for my appearance. Moses tells the people, God comes down on the mountain. When he does, the people all scream and run away. Moses then makes a statement to them that is amazing in Exodus 20, 20. He said, do not fear because God's come to test you to see if his fear is in you so that you may not sin. Now, wait a minute. Do not fear because God's come to see if his fear is in you? What is Moses doing, talking out of two sides of his mouth? No, he's differentiating between being scared of God and the fear of the Lord. There is a difference. The person who is scared of God has something to hide. What does Adam do when he sins against God? He hides from the presence of the Lord. The person who, who fears God has nothing to hide. That person is actually terrified of being away from God. So if you want your first definition of the holy, healthy fear of God, it is to be scared, even further terrified of being away from God. So what is the fear of the Lord? It is when we stand in awe of him and when we tremble before him. It's when we reverence, honor, and value him above everything and everyone else. What is important to him becomes important to me. What is not so important to him is not so important to me. It's when we love what he loves and it's when we hate what he hates. You say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. John, God hates? Yes, he hates. Now, let me alleviate some concerns here. I believe God really hates legalism because legalism misrepresents his heart. And legalism sometimes, I think, creates a very negative reaction in us to something that is actually God because we've been stung by it. A legalistic person is somebody that will make a comment like this. I fear God, that's why I hate those sinners over there. No, that man does not fear God at all because he hates who God loves. God loves those sinners quote sinners so much that he sent Jesus to die for them. What God hates is the sin that unmakes them. Are you with me? So when we fear God, we hate what he hates and we love what he loves. This is why Proverbs chapter 8 verse 3, I believe it is, I might be wrong on my reference, says all who fear the Lord will hate evil. Now notice it doesn't say they'll dislike evil. It doesn't say they'll tolerate evil or they'll coddle evil. They hate it. Paul takes it another step. He says, abhor what is evil. To abhor something means a very strong hatred. 
I'll never forget back in the early 1990s when Messenger International first started, I had a lot of time to pray because people weren't asking me to come preach. <laughs> so I was spending two hours praying every single morning and then I would start reading the Bible and studying. And I remember I would get asked to preach and I would stand up to preach and my words just didn't carry any weight. It would almost be like they'd go boing, 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 boing. And, and, and I started getting really frustrated. And I remember one morning praying and I said, God, I don't get it. You've called me to preach. I pray two hours every morning. I said, why isn't there a stronger anointing on my life? And the Holy Spirit whispered and he said, because you tolerate sin. I went, what? He said, because you tolerate sin, not only in your life, but in the lives of others. And he said, son, read Hebrews chapter one. And I go over to Hebrews chapter one and I find this is the day that God inaugurates Jesus as king of the universe, the day he's raised from the dead. And God the Father makes a statement to the son. He says, because you have loved righteousness. And the Holy Spirit said, son, stop. Every Christian loves righteousness, but that's not all I said. Because you love righteousness and hated sin, therefore God, even your God, has anointed you beyond your companions. He said, son, you learn to hate sin the way I hate sin. You'll see the anointing of God increase upon your life. So the fear of the Lord is when we grab God's heart. And what we're go what's going on today in the United States, we have got to learn to love the people that Jesus died for, which is everyone, but to absolutely hate what is unmaking them. Are you with me? And so if you wanna separate the fear of the Lord into two categories, you can do it. Category number one is to tremble at God's presence. Category number two that would also define the fear of the Lord is to tremble at his word. Now, what am I saying here? All right, let's talk about tremble at his presence first. God makes a statement to the prophet, through the prophet Jeremiah. He says, do you not fear me? Will you not tremble at my presence? I think sometimes the Church of America, we have forgotten who it is we are really serving. I look at Isaiah the prophet, one of the most godly men in Israel, probably the most godly man in Israel and in his generation. Yet in Isaiah 6, we have a rec record of God taking him out of his body and plopping him down right in front of the throne of God. And when Isaiah sees the throne, the first thing he notices are these massive angels called seraphim. And one is crying to the other, holy! Now it says, holy, 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 three times. And we wrote a song about it. And a lot of people yawn when we sing the song. But they're not singing a song to make God feel good about himself. Every moment, another facet of God's glory is being revealed to these angels, and one is crying to the other, holy, so loud. See, this is actually a Hebrew form of writing. Whenever the Hebrews would want to write and emphasize a word, they would write the word twice. Like you'll see at the Last Supper, Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you. Okay, if, if you're Jesus, you don't have a speech impediment. If you're John listening to Jesus, Jesus emphasized the word. He said to the guys at that last supper, verily I say unto you. And so John, in order to capture it, writes it twice. I mean, we bold face, we italicize when we wanna emphasize the word. You'll see when Jesus says, not everybody says to me, Lord, Lord. He doesn't have a speech impediment again. He is emphasizing the word Lord, so Matthew writes Lord twice. Well, very rarely does a Hebrew writer elevate a word to the third degree of succession. To do that means you can put no more emphasis on it. And you see it really rarely in the Bible because Hebrews are very careful with words. We're, we're sloppy. I mean, look, if you look at the word awesome, I mean, three years ago, everybody in church was using the word awesome. The Lego movie, everything is awesome, right? Do you know the only time you find awesome in the Bible is in regard to God or his attributes, right? So, I mean, you go see a movie, it was awesome. I went to a play, it was awesome. So I, as a man of God, stand up and say, God is awesome, and you think, yeah, so was my burger last night. So see, it's harder to communicate the glory of God when we've done down words. We've done the same thing with wonderful full of wonder, awesome, full of awe. So the Hebrews were really, really careful. So when a Hebrew wrote a word three times in succession, you could emphasize it no greater. And you only find it a couple times in scriptures. 
You find it once with David when Absalom was killed. You find it another time when the angels are flying over the heavens and they go, whoa, whoa, whoa. They're not saying whoa three times. They are saying so, whoa so loud. They're shaking the heavens, right? And so John writes it three times. Well, when Isaiah sees these angels, the one is crying to the other, holy, so loud. Isaiah writes, the, 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 the building in heaven that seats over a billion beings is shaken to its foundations by him who cries out. And what's amazing is they're not crying faithful, faithful, faithful. Is God faithful? Yeah, you better believe he's faithful. But that, that's not the attribute that stands out above all others. They're not crying even love, love, love. Is God love? Yes, he doesn't have love. He is love. But that's not his attribute that stands above all other attributes. It is his holiness. You know, Oswald Chambers wrote, I love this. Oswald Chambers said, when we preach the love of God, there is a danger of forgetting that the Bible reveals not first the love of God, but the intense blazing holiness of God with his love at the center of that holiness. So Isaiah, when he sees the Lord, doesn't go, yo, dude, there he is. Are you kidding? He is on his face, groveling on the floor, and he's crying out, woe is me. And what's amazing to me is that he's a preacher of righteousness. He's one of the most godly men in the, in the nation. I mean, one chapter earlier, it's woe to the sinner, woe to the proud, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. But now he has one glimpse of God. It's no longer woe is the sinner. It's woe is me. And for the first time in his life, he probably really realizes who it is he's serving. And for the first time in his life, he realizes who he is before this holy God. Job was one of the most godly men in the entire nation, the entire earth. Even God said he was. But yet God, Job made the statement, I've heard you by the hearing of the ear. I've heard about you in church, but now my eye sees you. I utterly abhor myself. Moses, when he saw God, he said he was terrified and shaking and trembling. If you look at John the Apostle, he was one of the closest disciples to Jesus, yet he sees Jesus on the deserted island of Patmos, and he's like a dead man. He falls down like a dead man. I'll never forget years ago when I was asked to speak at a national conference in the nation of Brazil. I was so excited because I had wanted, this is 1997, I had never been to Brazil. I've been there probably over 20 times now. But I was so excited. And this is a national conference for a church network of over 300,000 people down there. And I flew down to Brasilia, the capital where the conference was being held. And I remember they, they drove me to the arena. And I, I'll never forget it as long as I live. I mean, I could, I could hear the crowd from the outside. It was just so many people in there. And I remember I, I walked in, I walked in and they put me on the platform and, you know, the worship team was unbelievable. I mean, best in the nation. And, you know, they're, they're singing along and I'm standing there, but there, there, there's a problem. There's a complete absence of the presence of God. I mean, there's not an ounce of the presence of God in the entire arena and I remember I closed my eyes and I thought, whoa, 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 this is a believer's conference. And I said, God, where's your presence? And I remember opening my eyes and I started noticing things I didn't notice before I asked God, where's his presence? I saw people standing there during worship with their arms crossed looking around. I saw with their hands in their pocket looking down. I, I saw people talking. I saw people fumbling through their purses. I, I was watching people go down the big aisles and go to the concession stands that were all around the arena getting you know, their soft drinks, they were coming back to their seats, seeing their buddies, high five, what's going on? I'm like, wow, this will, this will probably stop. Well, they go through the entire worship set. I mean, there's not a seat open in the, in, in the whole place. This place is jammed. And, and that's why it was so confusing to me. Where is the presence of God? So, so they get done with the worship set, and now because there's no more music, you can hear a low, low mutter of all the conversations that are going on. People still walking around, doing everything. They're still standing there, looking around. And, and one of the leaders comes up and begins to read from the Bible. And you're still watching people move around, talking to each other. And I'm like, you're kidding me. And so I'm, stand, I'm standing there while he's reading. And the Holy Spirit said, son, you got to deal with this. 
I said, yeah, but how do I even get their attention? So he gave me an idea. So when they introduced me, I'll never forget this, I walked up and I just put my elbow, my translator's over here, and I just put my elbow on the podium and I just sat there and looked at everybody and didn't say a word. Now when you're the Friday night guest speaker of the national conference and you've been introduced and you're just standing there staring at everybody and not saying a word, that will get people's attention, especially when it's about 60 seconds because that seems like a long time. And I just sat there and stared and didn't say a word. All of a sudden, everybody stops moving. Everybody stops talking. The place goes totally silent. And I thought, okay, every eye's on me. You better keep their attention or they're going back to talking. And I remember, I didn't say to them, hey, great to be here. Thank you for having me. I knew if I said that, it was over. I lost them again. So this is the first words that ever came out of my mouth in Brazil in public. I said, I have a question. You're sitting talking to somebody across the table and the whole time you're talking to them, they got their arms crossed looking around as if they're disinterested. They got their hands in their pocket looking down or they're talking to somebody sitting next to them. I said, are you going to continue to speak to that person? No. I said, I have been in this arena for over an hour and there's a drop of the presence of God in this place because God will never come into a place where he is not held with the utmost of respect. I said, Psalm 89 verse seven says, God is to be greatly feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. I said, you've given no respect to him. I said, if the president of your nation would have walked on this platform tonight, you would have given him 10 times the respect you gave the Holy Spirit. I said, if Pele, your Michael Jordan of Brazil, your greatest soccer player, your national hero would have walked on this platform tonight. You would have been on the edge of your seats anticipating every word. I said, you've given no respect to the spirit of God. And for the next 75 minutes, I preached them on the fear of the Lord. After 75 minutes, I'll never forget this. I looked at him and I said, all right, you're in here. You say you're a believer, but you lack the fear of God and you're willing to repent. Stand to your feet. 75% of the arena stands to their feet. As soon as they did, the presence of God falls. Now people are weeping all over the auditorium. I'm hearing the sobs, I'm hearing people weep. The Holy Spirit said, son, lead them in a prayer. I led them in a prayer of repentance. And after about four or five minutes, it lifts. That presence lifts. And I'm standing there and the Holy Spirit said to me, son, I'm coming one more time. Now there is no way I can ever do justice to what I'm about to say, because of, or what happened, I should say. But I want you to imagine being at the end of San Antonio Airport's runway and a Boeing jet takes off in front of you. That kind of a violent wind came blowing into that arena. When it did, the people started screaming in prayer. Now can you imagine thousands of Brazilians screaming in prayer? How loud that would be. The wind was louder. I remember so well, like it was yesterday, and yet this was 1997. I am literally standing there, and I am, now listen to what I'm about to say. I am petrified, but yet I'm drawn to it. It's the hardest thing to describe. I'm actually sitting there, standing there, I should say, and the thought goes through my mind at one point. John Bevere, you say one wrong word, you make one wrong move, you're dead. Now, would that have happened? I don't know. But there was a man and a wife who came to their church service in Jerusalem. And they came into that church service, that atmosphere, with that presence, with irreverence, and they buried both of them the same day. I had never experienced an authority, a presence, like what was in that arena. I remember I am standing there, and there's like goosebumps on my goosebumps, and all that's coming out of my mouth is, oh my God. And people are literally screaming. And this wind lasts for about 90 seconds, and I'll never forget it subsided. And it left in its wake, people collapsed all over the arena. I'm seeing people just bowed over their chairs, weeping. I'm seeing people collapsed. They're on the floor, in the aisles. And I'll never forget this. I'm standing there. I'm like, God, what do I do next? And the, and the Spirit of God said, son, I'm through with you. So I said to the leader, it's all yours. <laughs> so they whisked me out to the car. They put the soloist that night and her husband in the car with me and she screams did you hear the wind and I said maybe it was a jet aircraft that flew over the arena too low and she goes what are you talking about and her husband said that wasn't any jet aircraft I said how do you know he said there were security men and policemen all around the outside of the arena he said they're union workers most of them aren't even believers 
He said, when the wind began to blow, they heard it, and they came running in to see what was going on. He said, secondly, I was staying at the soundboard to make sure that my wife's volumes are right when she sang. She said, the whole time the wind was blowing, I'm looking at the decimal meters, and they're at zero. Not one bit of that sound came through our sound system. And they said to me, do you want to go eat? And I said, no, I really don't. Take me to my hotel. And I'll never forget, I sat on my hotel balcony until 1.30 in the morning in awe of what God had done. The next morning, same arena, you cannot believe the miracles of healings and people getting filled with the Holy Spirit that occurred all because of one word, because of awe, because of reverence. We got snail mail and we got emails for 20 years of people saying how their lives were changed. In 2016, I went down to speak to 12,000 pastors in Goiania, Brazil. The, The pastor that met me said, John, I was in the building 20 years ago when the wind blew. My life has never been the same. That is because, that is why, let me, let me tell you something. That is what happens when you encounter the awe of God. You are never, ever, ever the same. God says in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1, by those who come near me, I must, not I should be, I must be regarded as holy. I remember two years after Brazil, I was asked to do another national conference in the nation of Malaysia. It was being held in the capital city of Kuala Lumpur. This time it was an arena like this. It wasn't an, an, or excuse me, it was an auditorium like this, not an arena. But people had come from all over the nation of Malaysia. There, it was the biggest Bible school. The whole building was jam-packed. And again, that presence manifested. There was no wind this time, but the presence was even stronger. And I will never forget it as long as I live. Literally, people are being baptized in fire and crying out to God. And I'll never forget this. I'm standing there, and again, I'm thinking, make a wrong move, say a wrong word, you're dead. I just have no other way of describing it. I remember on that one, I started pacing very cautiously, and all of a sudden, you know, two or three minutes into it, words come out of my mouth that my mind had never thought of before in my life. And out of my mouth came these words, this is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And my mind kicked in and I thought to myself, that's it. That's one of the seven manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah said the spirit of the Lord would rest upon Jesus, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And I remember this one lasted five or six minutes. It subsides. People are collapsed all over the auditorium. I'm standing there again, and I'm like, God, what do I do? And the Holy Spirit said to me, son, I'm through with you again. So I turn it over to the leader. He comes up this time. This, this, this man's smart. He said, look, we had a song plan for the end of the service tonight. He said, we're not doing it. You just stay as long as you want. And I remember I stayed for about 15 minutes, but it was our 10th service, so I was exhausted. And I remember I started walking out of the auditorium, and I'm in the back, just going out the back doors. And there's a couple that's standing there. And they're from the nation of India. They were Bible school students. And I happened to notice that she was one of the ones that really got nailed. So was he. But I'll never forget this. I'm walking up, and there they are standing, and they're just looking at me. And I'm looking at them. And we're not saying anything. Because what do you say? Cool service. Yeah, man, totally rad. You know, I mean, we're just staring at each other. And after about 30 seconds of just staring at each other, she breaks the silent. And she goes, I feel so clean inside. I thought to myself, that's it. That's it. That describes perfectly what I felt in Brazil, in North Carolina, in Texas. Because it's only happened about four or five times in my life. I wish it happened every week. And I thought, that's what I sensed after all those experiences with with the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And I I remember leaving, and in my hotel room that night, I just kept thinking, she nailed it. Clean, clean, that's that's it. So the next morning, I'm getting ready to play basketball with the Bible school students in Malaysia, and I'm putting on my gym shorts, and the Holy Spirit said to me, son, read Psalm 19. 
Now, I had no idea what I was going to read in Psalm 19. So I go over to Psalm 19. I start reading verse 1, verse 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Then I get to verse 9. And verse 9 says this, the fear of the Lord is clean. I went, oh my gosh, there it is. Now look at the next words. Enduring forever. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me in that hotel room and he said, son, Lucifer led worship right before my throne. He beheld my glory. He was anointed to do so. He didn't fear me. He didn't endure forever in heaven. He said, a third of the angels surrounded my throne. They beheld my glory. They didn't fear me. They didn't endure forever. He said, Adam and Eve walked in the presence of my glory. They didn't fear me. They didn't endure in the garden forever. He said, son, every created being that surrounds my throne throughout eternity will be tested in the holy fear of God. I remember at that day I started thinking, there are ministers that have started in ministry, but they didn't fear God, they didn't endure in ministry forever. Barna tells us that in the last 20 years, Four years, over 23 million Americans have walked away from the faith. They have gone from being practicing Christians to agnostic, spiritualists, and atheists. This is one out of every 14 Americans. Is there a reason? I believe it's because we have not preached the holy, healthy fear of God. You still with me? I said, are you still with me? All right. The fear of the Lord is when we tremble at his word. Everybody say tremble at his word. God makes a statement. The nation of Israel was a lot like the American church. They were selectively obeying God. When it was convenient, they obeyed. When it wasn't convenient, they didn't obey. So God says through the prophet, your sacrifices, your lamb sacrifices, your wheat sacrifices, your, your, your grain offerings, all this stuff, it's like offering pig's blood. It's like killing a man. And the people were in utter shock. And then the, then the Lord makes this statement. But this is the one to whom I will look. The word look there means pay close attention to. <sighs> Did you just hear what I said? This is the one I'm going to pay close attention to. Tommy Tenney wrote a book years ago. He called it The God Chasers. It sold a lot of books. It was actually a movement. People, I'm a God chaser. Can I say it's one thing to chase God, it's a whole nother thing to have God chasing you? Right. Say God chases people. Didn't he send Samuel to Jesse's house? <clears throat> Jesse brought the seven most likely candidates out. God said, I'm not chasing those boys. I'm chasing the little ruddy one following the sheep. You still with me? God says, this is the one that I'm basically paying very close attention to. On him or her who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. What does it mean to tremble at the word of God? It means we obey him immediately. Do you ever meet somebody and they make this statement off the cuff? Well, you know, the Lord's been dealing with me about this now for several weeks. And they laugh. And I'm thinking, you're laughing about your lack of godly fear. David says in Psalm 119, New Living Translation, I will hurry to obey your commands. When we tremble at his word, we will obey God even if it doesn't make sense. Has God ever told you to do something that doesn't make sense? Does it make sense to forgive somebody who's really hurt your family? Does it make sense to bless somebody who has cursed you so bad that you lost your job over it? Do I need to go on? When we tremble at God's word, we obey God even if it hurts. The Bible says that Jesus obeyed the Father to the point of death. And then Peter tells us, as Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself with the same mind. Now, don't get me wrong. Religion seeks suffering to please the God, little g it serves. However, Christianity is when we know we live in a fallen world culture, but yet we're still going to obey God, even if we know 
we're going to be persecuted or suffer affliction for it. To tremble at his word means we will obey God even if we don't see a benefit. I think what we've done in the American church is we've almost raised up disciples that will only obey God if they see the benefit of obeying God. If you pray, God will do this. If you obey, God will do this. If you serve, God will do this. If you give, God will do this. Will God do this, this, and this, and this? Yes, you better believe it. But that better not be our motive for doing it. Because what if that was Esther's motive? Esther had absolutely nothing to gain and everything to lose, including her head. But she looks at Mordecai and said, I'm going before the king. If I die, I die. She feared God. When we fear God, we will obey him to completion. King Saul did 99.99% of what God asked him to do. Yet God said, he's disobeyed me. If King Saul would have been a millennial today, he would have said, why don't you look at the 99.9% that I did? Why are you looking at the .01 I didn't do? Jesus said, when you've done all these things which you're commanded, say we're unprofitable servants, we've only done that which is our duty to do. When we fear, when we tremble at God's word, we will not allow cultural narratives to pervert God's word. When we fear God, we will not avoid the convicting aspects of God's word. When we fear God, we will, when we tremble at his word, we will not use his word for our personal advantage. I'll never forget, I'm in a worship service in a conference, and, I'll, and, the, and the spirit of God right in the middle of this worship service said, son, do you know what a religious spirit is? And I thought, Okay, God, when he asks me questions, is not looking for information. Yeah, religious spirits, this, this, and this, thanks. I'm re I really needed to know that. I know, th I know better. I was mature enough to know that. So even though I had written on it, preached on it, heard other people preach on it, I remember when I, I, I sat there in the front row, I said, I obviously don't know what a religious spirit is. What is it? And he said, a religious spirit is one who uses my word to execute his own desires. Now, can I show you some of the benefits of the fear of God in the last couple of minutes that we have? Would you like that? <laughs> in 30 years of seeking God, I have found over, over 40 amazing benefits that is only promised in Scripture to those who fear God. Would you like to know a couple of them? I mean, there's no way I can go through all 40 if you want to get, get the book, okay? But, but let me tell you the one that I love the most, the number one benefit of the fear of the Lord. Number one, you ready? is friendship with God. Yes. Psalm 25 verse 14 makes a statement that I love. It says, friendship with the Lord is reserved for those who fear him. With them he shares his secrets. <laughs> Are you seeing this? You know what God is saying there? Not everybody is my friend. Can I get a little more specific? Not everybody in the church is my friend. It's reserved for the people who fear me. All right, who's the first one called the friend of God in Scripture? Abraham. Why is, why is Abraham called the friend of God? Because when Abraham's old, God comes to him one night, one night and goes, Abe, yes, Lord, yes, 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 yes. You know your son that you love more than anything or anyone else? The one you waited for for 25 years that I promised you? Yeah, Isaac, he's sleeping right now. Abe, I want you to go on a three-day journey and sacrifice him for me. Now that's all he says. He doesn't say, if you go sacrifice Isaac, I'll send my son. He just says, go sacrifice him. And Abraham doesn't have Genesis to read. Okay, can you imagine what that night was like for him? No sleep. Wait a minute. The nations are coming from him. He was promised to me. I would rather sacrifice myself. Now, I want you to see what the Bible says. Early the next morning. Well, you know, the Lord's been dealing with me about this now for several months. 
early the next morning. He's on his way. Now, God gives him a three-day journey. Why? Because it's a little easier when you heard the booming voice of God the night before. But what about two and a half days later when you haven't heard a word from heaven and now you're looking at the mountain, you're going to put the most important person or thing to death in your life just because God said do it and didn't give you a reason. But Abraham goes to the mountain and there he is building this altar with his 13-year-old son. Can you imagine this? And then to really put salt in the wound, Isaac goes, where's the sacrifice, dad? God will provide. Just keep building. And so he builds the altar. He ties Isaac up. He lifts the knife. He's ready to put the most important person or thing to death in his life just because God said do it and didn't give him a reason. And the angel of the Lord appears and look what the angel says. Abraham, stop because now I know you fear God. How does the angel know that he feared God? Because he obeyed instantly. Because he obeyed when it didn't make sense. Because he obeyed when it hurt. Because he obeyed when he didn't see a benefit. And because he obeyed to completion. Abraham puts down the knife gladly, unties Isaac, lifts up his eyes. There's a ram caught in the thicket and out of his spirit comes Jehovah Jireh. Okay? God just revealed a facet of his personality to Abraham no human being had ever known because he's my friend. You're not getting this, are you? Okay, you all know me as John Bevere preacher. Some of you know me as John Bevere author. Some of you know me as John Bevere good friend. But there is a woman, and I showed you her picture. She knows me as John Bevere husband. She knows me as John Bevere dad. John Bevere G dad. She knows me as John Bevere athlete. She knows me as John Bevere uh, best friend. Can I say this? None of you will ever know me as John Bevere husband. That is a, that is a facet of my personality that is reserved for the closest person to me on the face of the earth. God just revealed a facet of his personality to Abraham no human being had ever known because he's my friend. Now look at the relationship between God and Abraham. It is amazing. One day the Lord makes a statement, should we do to Sodom and Gomorrah what we're planning on doing without first talking to our friend Abraham? So the Lord comes down by the terebinth trees and he and Abraham go and they walk over to a cliff overlooking the plains of Jordan. And the Lord looks at Abe and goes, Abe, yes, Lord, yes. We're thinking about blowing up these two cities. What do you think? Abe goes, Sodom? And the Lord goes, yeah, 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 and Gomorrah. What do you think? And Abe goes, Oh my gosh, think my nephew's over there, lots over there. Oh my gosh, think. Okay, Lord, you wouldn't like blow up those two cities if there was 50 righteous people, would you? And the Lord goes, excellent idea, excellent idea. Okay, we will not blow up the cities if there's 50 righteous people. Glad we talked to our friend Abraham. Abraham goes, what if there's in 50? Okay, wait a minute, Lord, what about 45? Would you blow it up if there was 45? The Lord goes, another good idea. Okay, we'll not blow up the cities if there's 45. Glad we talked to our friend Abraham. Now, we all know the story. He talked him all the way down to 10. Because he figures there's got to be 10, lots, one, all I need is nine other guys. But there isn't. Now here's the thing. The Bible says Sodom and Gomorrah is buying, selling, marrying, giving in marriage, planting and harvesting. What, what is that today in our vernacular? Life is great. The economy's booming. And if there's a God, he doesn't mind our lewd lifestyle. They're 24 hours away from being obliterated. And they're clueless. That's not what's scary. This is what is scary. Lot, everybody say Lot. Lot. Who the Bible calls righteous. Second Peter chapter two. Let me put it in today's terminology. Saved, born again, Christian. Lot's 24 hours away from being obliterated and he's as clueless as Sodom. It takes two messengers of mercy, two angels, because Abraham prayed Oh, yeah, go look it up. Thank God Abraham prayed to get him out. So here we have two righteous men. Let me put it in today's terminology. Two saved men, two born-again men. One righteous man knows what God's going to do before he does it and helps God decide how he's going to do it. The other righteous saved born-again man is as clueless as the world. Why? Because this righteous saved born-again man fears God, therefore he's the friend of God, therefore God shares his secrets with him. This righteous, saved, born-again man does not fear God. Therefore, he is not the friend of God. Therefore, God does not share his secrets with him. You see the same thing with Moses and Israel. You say, John, is this in the New Testament? Yep. It sure is. Jesus makes a statement that we preach. 
We write books, we write songs. He said, you are my friends, and we never finish his statement. Because there is a condition on this statement. He said, you're my friends if. Now let me share something with you. If I look at you and say, if you work for me next week for 40 hours, I'll pay you, you $2,000. Say, if you work for me. And you don't work for me, and you come looking for the $2,000. I'm going to say, you didn't work for me. I'm not paying you. I said, if you work for me. It's not automatic. Jesus said, you're my friends, if. It's not automatic. Well, then my question is, it, how, do, how do we enter into a relationship of friendship with Jesus? If we do whatever he commands us. There it is. The fear of the Lord, trembling at God's word. There's over 500 commands in the New Testament. He's saying, John, whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you saying we've got to obey the commands to have a relationship with God? No, no, no. The Old Testament, the commands were given to earn a relationship with God. We proved we could never, ever, ever, ever do it. The New Testament, the commands aren't given to earn a relationship because a relationship is a free gift. It's called grace. But those commands are given to enhance our relationship of intimacy with the Lord. Still with me? You getting something out of this? What's the second benefit? Joy. Everybody say joy. joy. Psalm 112 says, how joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying his commands. Now this almost seems like an oxymoron. You think, I fear God, therefore I have a great joy and gladness. I have great delight. Yes. If you'll remember, Paul writes to the Philippian Christians and he said, as you have obey always obeyed me in my presence, even so more, even so now more in the absence of my presence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. What God is saying to us through that is that when you fear me, when you work out your salvation with fear and trembling, I work in you both the desire and the ability to do my will. This is why you can have two Christians standing side by side for one, it's kind of a drudge, drudgery to obey the word of God. The other one, it's a great delight. What's the difference? This person fears God, this person doesn't. God is working both the will and to do. That's not happening in this person. All right, let me give you one more. You want one more? You can look at the other 37 in the book. Wisdom. Let's go to wisdom. We've all heard this. If you've been in church longer than six months, you've heard this, the fear of the Lord, even if you've not been in church, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Why don't we finish the story? Why don't we continue the story, I should say? Because Proverbs 15 tells us the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the traps of death. Now, there's so much here. Okay, everybody say death. Yeah. Death comes in traps. Everybody say traps. Yeah. Okay. Anybody ever trapped here before? What do you need to successfully trap animals? The trap has to be baited, and the trap has to be camouflaged. Death is baited, and death is camouflaged. Got it? Now, the fear of the Lord is a fountain. Everybody say fountain. fountain. The Hebrew word there for fountain, do you know what it means? A continual flowing source. That's what that word means. That's why the translators chose the word fountain. It's a continual flow. Are you following this? Now, it says it's a fountain of life. More specifically, what is a fountain of? Proverbs 14, 27 tells us the fear of the Lord is the instruction of of wisdom. So if you put that together, what do you, what, what do you find out? The fear of the Lord, the Lord is a continual flow of the instruction of wisdom that turns us away from the traps of death. Okay. 
Let me give you an example. Can I give you an example? I'm going to give you an example of a guy who had no relationship with God, but yet he feared God. You say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You can have no relationship with God and fear God. Yes. Look at Cornelius. He's a Roman centurion, but he fears God. The Bible says he was devout. The word devout, if you go into the Greek, it means he feared God. And God sends an angel, and the angel says to Cornelius, hey, I can't tell you how to get saved, but Peter's down there in Joppa at Simon's house, the tanner, send for him, and he'll tell you how to get saved. Okay? So Cornelius was a man who feared God even though he didn't have a relationship with God. Are you seeing what I'm saying? So I want to talk about another guy who feared God and had no relationship with God. You, you follow me? All right, I want to talk to you about this guy named Abimelech. Okay, who is Abimelech? Abimelech is the king of Gear. So Abraham and Sarah come into his nation, and Abraham looks at his wife and goes, babe, you are far too gorgeous for me to present you as my wife. I'm going to tell him you're my sister, because if I present you as my wife, they're going to kill me and take you. So he comes before King Abimelech, and he presents Sarah, his sister, Sarai, to be honest, his sister. Got it? Okay. Abimelech's no dummy. He takes Abraham's sister, Sarah into his harem. God then comes to Abimelech that night and says, you are a dead man because the woman you have is another man's wife. And Abimelech goes, put, put the scripture up so they can see it. Look, Abimelech goes, Lord, I didn't know. I didn't know. Abraham told me she was his sister. And God said to him, listen to what God said to him. He said, I know. Come on, go with me. Go with me. Next one. I know you're innocent. That's why I kept you from sinning against me and why I did not let you touch her. The fear of the Lord was a continual flow of the instruction of wisdom that protected Abimelech from the trap that Abraham set for him because he feared God. Now, how in the world can a man sit in church for 10 years and hear the word of God and end up in bed with another man's wife? It's not rocket science. No fear of God. How can a pastor preach the word of God for 15 years and end up in bed with his assistant, another man's wife? It's not rocket science. No fear of God. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of the flow of wisdom that will keep us from the traps of death. If he's doing it for a king like Abimelech who has no relationship with him, how much more is he going to do it with us who have a relationship with him? Now flip it. Now flip it. The fear of the Lord is a continual flow of the instruction of wisdom. Every day we're all making decisions. We're all entrepreneurs in one way or another. If you're really doing the will of God, you're an entrepreneur even if you're a stay-at-home mom. We have decisions we have to make every day. I've come to realize 95% of the time that I'm, flowing, I'm operating in the wisdom of God, I don't consciously know it. Just like Abimelech didn't consciously know that he was operating in the wisdom of God, avoiding the trap of death that was set before him by Abraham. Even so, I believe we're operating in that flow of wisdom probably 90, over 90% of the time not even realizing we're operating in God's wisdom because of our holy fear. The fear of the Lord is a continual flow of the instruction of wisdom to turn you away from the traps of death. I don't know about you, but I don't know how, why anybody wouldn't delight in the fear of the Lord. I'm gonna end it with this story and then I'll close. 1994, I was asked to visit one of the best known human beings in the world. But he was the best known human being for all the wrong reasons. 
He had the largest ministry on the planet in the 1980s. His television ministry was the largest in the world. I would watch him as a young Christian. I was in my 20s. I would watch him weep as he preached the gospel. And he got arrested for mail fraud and he's, his trial was covered every single night on CNN headline news. And that man was convicted. He was sentenced for 45 years. It got reduced down to five years. Five years, four years into his sentence, 1994, he read the first book I wrote and it impacted him so deeply. He called his assistant from prison and said, would you please reach out to this man and see if he'd come visit me. And so my wife and I decided to drive up because it was only four hours away. So we drove up to the federal penitentiary where he was. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. He came walking into that waiting room with all of his prison garb on. Here's a man I watched for 10 years who everybody watched that was a Christian in this country if you were, if you were a spirit-filled Christian. And I remember he had all, the, all, all that, that prison garb on and I'll never forget he walks straight up to me, grabs me, and just hugs me and won't let me go for about a minute. And then he puts his hand on my shoulders and he's 25 years older than me. He puts his hand on my shoulders and said, did you write this book? I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, we have so much to talk about and we only have 90 minutes. So we sit down. The first thing he says out of his mouth after we sat down is he said, John, I need you to know this prison wasn't God's judgment on my life. It was his mercy. He said, if I continued living the way I was living, I would have ended up in hell separated from God forever and ever. Boy, I'll tell you all my walls went down right then. He told me how when he came into prison, the first year of prison, Jesus delivered him from the wickedness that was in his life. And he said, John, there was a lot of wickedness. He shared with me how that they had, been, they had actually a prison church and they spent three hours a day in the word of God. I said, well, of course you're leading this prison church. And he said, absolutely not. I'm a master manipulator and I'm not going back there. I'm not doing that again. I'm letting somebody else lead it. I remember after him telling me the whole story, I had one really, really, really big pressing question. It was my question I went in there wanting to ask and I saw my opening after about 20 minutes of him sharing his testimony and I said, can I ask you a question? I'm, I'm a young man, I'm in my early 30s. I said, I watched you preach all through the decade of the 80s on television. I said, I, I need to know something. How and when did you fall out of love with Jesus? And he looked at me and he said, John, I didn't. Now, I remember when he said, I didn't, the walls went back up. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. In 1983, you committed adultery, and I named the woman's name. I said, you did all this stuff for the next seven years that you just told me about this wickedness. And you're telling me you love Jesus? He said, John, I loved him all the way through it. And he sees the total, complete bewilderment on my face. And I'm just sitting there looking at him in shock. And then he looks at me and he says, John, I didn't fear God. He said, there's millions of Americans just like me. They love Jesus, but they have no fear of God. Moses said, God's come to see if his fear's in you so that you may not sin. The Bible says, by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. The Bible says that we perfect holiness in the fear of God, not the love of God. Love keeps us from being legalistic, but fear keeps us from being lawless. It takes both forces to keep us on the road to life. Did you get something out of this tonight? Amen. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you've given to us tonight. I'm so grateful for what you've done. Holy Spirit of God, I'm asking now that you would draw men and women toward your, toward your heart. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed. I first of all wanna ask you if you have an authentic, genuine relationship with Jesus. And I want you to examine yourself the Bible makes it so clear that Jesus is the groom and we're the bride. 
And Paul makes the statement, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, the two shall become one. He said, but this is actually an illustration of the way the church and Jesus are one. When a girl walks down an aisle of a church with a white dress on, she's actually making a pretty strong statement. She's saying goodbye to about 3.9 billion guys. She's saying, this is the one and only man I'm giving my entire life to. It's not just a sinner's prayer that gets a person saved because you can still have a bunch of lovers in your life. It's when we say, Jesus, just as a bride does on her wedding day, I'm giving you my entire life and I am no longer going to flirt or entertain or engage with what you died for. I am giving you 100% of my heart and life. I want to ask you, have you done what that bride does? Have you given your entire life to him the way she does on her wedding day to that one man? If you haven't, you can do it tonight because Jesus has already given himself fully for you. He came and died a death that we can't even comprehend. If you say, John, truth be told, I really haven't done that. I've prayed the sinner's prayer. I enjoy church. I like the atmosphere. I like the people. But I've never given him my entire life the way a bride does on her wedding day. Then I want to give you a chance to do it right now. Do you want to give Jesus your entire life? I want to give you that opportunity. But you've got to break up with those lovers that offend him. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand up and say, I want, wow, look at the hands. Just put them up high. I want you to do something. No bride's ever been ashamed of her groom. There's about 60, 70, 80 of you. Stand to your feet immediately. Just stand up. I want to pray for you tonight. Anybody else? I want you to keep your heads bowed, your eyes closed. Anybody else? Hey, sometimes a bride's got to think. I mean, sometimes it takes a few minutes of counting the cost of saying goodbye to those lovers. Is there anyone else that says, man, I want to be standing, but you're sitting. Can you ask yourself the question, why are you sitting? Because let me tell you, Jesus is not going to force you. Just like no groom would ever force his fiance to marry him or his girlfriend to become his fiance. Jesus is not going to force you. But if you say, I, I want to be standing, then ask yourself, why aren't I standing? Is it because you want to play Russian roulette? with your own life, with your eternal life? Is there anyone else? I wanna make sure nobody's missed. Yes, sir, you were worth the wait. Anybody else? Just stand up right now if that's you. I wanna make sure, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Anyone else? Yes, sir. You guys are worth the wait. All right, this is what I want you to do. I want you to look at me, every one of you. I want you to slide, I want you to, listen, slide up into the aisles. I want you to come on down and I want to pray for you to receive Jesus. And can the rest of us give them a big hand as they come? Come on. Hey, I'm so proud of you. Come on down. Come on down. Come on. Give them a hand. Come on. All the way down to me. Come on down. Hey, I'm so proud of you. Hey, proud of you. Come on. Keep coming. Keep coming. I'm so proud of you and you and you and you and you and you and you. And you, and you, and you, and you, and you. Come on, keep coming. Come on, there's room down here. Come on, keep coming down. Keep coming down. So proud of you guys. Come on, keep coming. We got a lot of room down in here. Come on down. Come on down. All right. If you're out there and you, well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I just got to say something to you guys first. Why do you all have these sad looks on your face? I mean, have you ever seen a bride coming down going, ah? This is the greatest decision you have ever made. You, hey, if, if, you, if, if you could see Jesus right now, he's got the biggest smile on his face. A while ago, he was hopeful. He was going, man, I died for them. I hope they say yes. I mean, just like when that groom gets down on his knee and opens up that little box, he's thinking, I hope she says yes. And when she does, he screams and she screams. Well, let me tell you, heaven's having a party right now. You got it? Because heaven is so excited about you giving your life. 
because God is gaining some more sons and daughters. He's been waiting on you, honey. He's been waiting on you, you know that? Okay, let me do something here. Let me do something. I want you to close your eyes. Hey, can the rest of you stand up and let, let's be, because the presence of God is about to hit this place. Now I want you, this is what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to raise your hands. You say, why are you having me raise my hands? This is an outward, outward sign of what you've done inwardly. You're saying, I'm all yours, Jesus. A little softer. I love what you're doing, but a little softer. Softer on the volume. All right, now, close your eyes. Everybody in here do this. I want you to close your eyes with your hands raised. And you can go just a tad louder. And just open the eyes of your heart. Okay? We're all going to do this now. And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit of God to reveal Jesus to you. Spirit of the Lord God. Manifest the presence of Jesus. He's here. Wow, right there. There's his presence right there. Wow. Okay. He's here. Jesus. You're so wonderful. Thank you. There's his presence right there. You see his eyes? Can anybody see his eyes? See those eyes, how delighted yet strong they are? So rich and deep with love. There's no anger in those eyes, there's no disgust. There he is right there. That's his presence. Touch them in Jesus' name, Master. See the smile on his face? I can see. It, it's not just a smile. He's laughing while he's smiling. He's so happy. There's his presence right there, right there. We haven't even prayed yet, and he's already manifesting. There's his presence right there. He's in this place. Jesus, Master. Who? Dear Lord God, thank you. If you say, I'm a believer but I have lacked the fear of God and I want the holy fear of God. Lift up your hands right now. Just lift them up. Say this out loud. Dear Father in heaven, forgive me for living life my way. Forgive me for selectively obeying you. Really, I've been the one that has been in charge, it's been in charge, even though even I've though said you were in charge. I said you were in charge. Tonight, that's all changing. Tonight, that's changing. This night, this night, say it out loud. I give you my spirit, soul, and body. I give you my spirit, soul, everything I am, everything, that I, everything I have. Everything that I have. Jesus, Jesus, you are now my King, now my, king. my Lord, my, Lord. my supreme Master. My groom, my life, I'm yours forever. Thank you for cleansing me with your royal blood and welcoming me into your household. Now I ask you, baptize me in the holy awe of God, the holy fear of the Lord God. In Jesus' name. There's his presence right there, right there, right there. Whew. There he is right there. That's his presence. (laughs) 
so, so good. He's so good. Fill us, Master, that we might serve you, that we might love you, that we might please you. Baptize us in the holy fear of God. May we delight in the fear of the Lord as Jesus delights in the fear of the Lord. Boy, it's like a river in here right now. Somebody's right hand's being healed by the power of God right there. Somebody's knees being healed by the power of God. There's the fire of God's just going down somebody's spinal cord right now, bringing complete wholeness to your spinal cord. There's a tumor dissolving right now in the presence of God. It's literally dissolving. It's shrinking. It's shriveling. Somebody's intestines are being healed by the power of God right now. Literally, it's, 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 I see fire burning through your intestines and purifying you and healing you. Somebody you've had absolute terrible sores in your mouth, you're being healed by the power of God. Some, one, somebody in here, you've had terrible headaches. You're being healed by the power of God right now. Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Somebody's right foot's being healed by the power of God right there. Your foot is being literally healed. I don't understand it. I don't get it, but your foot's being healed. There, there's the presence of God right there. Now I want you to just lift your hands and thank him. Thank him. Come on, thank him out loud with your mouth. Just, just say something to him. Mean it from your heart. Father, thank you so much for what you've done tonight. We're so grateful to you. And Lord, I thank you for all these people that now are in a very real and authentic relationship with you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we're so grateful for what you've done. Thank you for your presence. Oh, he's still in this place. We give you glory. We give you honor. And we give you all the praise. Now give him thanks right now. Amen. 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 All right, I want you to be honest now. Hey, don't lie to me. First thing you do after you pray, okay? How many of you felt the presence of God? Let me see your hands. Put your hands up. Put them up high. Okay, you know what that was? What's your name? Austin. Austin, you know what that was? What was that? That was God saying, Austin, you're my boy. What's your name? Chelsea. Chelsea, you're my girl. That's what he was saying, right? So listen, you walk out there and the devil goes, nothing happened. Tell him to shut up in that tone of voice. You got it? You got it? You got it? Everybody, you got it? You got it? Amen. You got that? You got that? Amen. Hey, oh, let me say this. Um, I only got three of the promises. Hey, here's the book. Um, when I wrote it, I said, God, what do I do? I said, people aren't reading today. He said, write short chapters. Good idea. So I wrote 42 chapters. All but two chapters only have six pages. The other two chapters have eight pages. All right, 42 is 42 days. 42 days is what? Six weeks. So the book's broken up into six sections, seven chapters. At the end of every chapter is the five Ps. That's the passage, the promise, the ponder, the prayer, and the, pa and the profession. Okay? So it's not a devotional. You can read it from cover to cover. Okay, but I set it up so you can just spend five minutes reading the chapter if it's only six pages. If you're a really slow reader, eight minutes, okay? And you can get through that and the five Ps you can do. And then at the end of the book, there's a QR code in Appendix 1. And it's got a, that QR code will bring you right to a website that has 42 four-minute videos. So I got a four-minute video for every day. And the publisher said, are you going to charge for that? And I said, No. They said, you're gonna give that to me? I said, yes. So when you, you know, right now, and I, I wanna say this, I don't know why my team didn't do this, but they only sent about, you know, 96 out there. But I got good news. Y'all are Prime members, right? 
Hello. Okay. Amazon's got the book on sale. It's a $29 book. They got it on sale right now for about $15 and some odd cents. Okay. Hey, we're, we're charging 20 out there. Okay. And don't try to get it for 15 because you know what? You'll help the ministry. But listen, this is the way I feel about it. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't care. Give the money to Jeff Bezos. It's all going to burn up one day. What's more important to me is that you get the message. Okay. And let me say this. Here is the group, here's the group or individual study. This has six 30 minute videos that come with this. It's, it's, it, it's, it's a link, okay? And so this is made for group or individual study. So if you, get your, if you really wanna put a stop to people that are walking away from the faith, get a group of your besties and go through this together. Okay, it makes it a lot of fun, okay? I hope we've got those back there, but if we don't have them, Bezos got them too. Okay, I love you guys. Thanks for being our family. Hey, thanks for laboring with us to make disciples of all nations. I love what's happening with Kufi. I have so much respect for what is happening through Kufi. But it's so cool that these two ministries, we can work together to get a lot of what God has called us to do to get it accomplished. What a privilege to be able to do it. He's the one that does it. We're the ones that just get to watch him do it. Isn't it fun? I love you guys. God bless you. Pastor Hagee again, thank you. Diane, thank you. Matt, love you. God bless you. Yes, sir. Did you enjoy the word of the Lord tonight as God used John Bevere to share it? We're about to be dismissed, but as John was mentioning this book, it's available in our lobby, our newly renovated lobby. How many of you have been out there and enjoyed that space in that place out there? It's a wonderful spot. i tell you something about this book. He shares a story in this book, a testimony about your very own pastor. You see, one of the benefits of the awe of God, immediate obedience is protection. And you've heard pastors share about how an individual who was full of the devil tried to kill him in his own church. Well, whenever you're asking God to make sure no weapon formed against you prospers, one of the benefits is that when you actually have a weapon form against you, guess what? It doesn't prosper. John shares about that in this book and a number of other stories that help transform your life to understand the reality of God's presence on a daily basis and I assure you, each and every one of us need that more now than ever. Amen. I encourage you to get a copy of this book and utilize it not only as a resource in your life, but also in the lives of those that you know need to hear God's word. Would you raise your hand for the blessing? Father, thank you because your word is alive and it is powerful. In each of our lives, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It not only defends and protects, but it separates so, Lord, what it has cut out of our lives tonight, let us leave it in this altar. And what it has brought into our hands, let us use it as a weapon of truth in a generation of deception. As a weapon of light in an hour of darkness. As a declaration of your kingdom that will never end. We ask that you would bless John tonight in his ministry. I ask that you would bless all who are gathered in this place. Keep them. Make your face to shine upon them. Be gracious unto them and give them your peace. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and ask. And all of God's children said praise the Lord. God bless you, church. You are dismissed. We'll see you next Lord's Day. watching Hagee Ministries.